WRFT Atlanta, 89.3 FM, your station for progressive information. WRFG provides a voice for those who have been traditionally denied access to broadcast media through the involvement of a broad base of community elements to guarantee that access. In the utilization of the Foundation's facilities and in its programs, the following communities will receive first priority. Those who continue to be denied free and open access to the broadcast media and those who suffer oppression or exploitation based upon class, race, sex, age, creed, disability, sexual orientation, or immigrant status. The following program is made possible by a grant from the Committee for the Humanities in Georgia. I don't think it lasted long, but it was terrifying while it lasted. It was a terrible time here in Atlanta. Everybody was just so scared. I was just so scared they were coming. I will never forget it as long as I live. That's just as vivid now as a picture in front of my face. The riot of 1906 was the worst outbreak of racial hostility Atlanta has ever experienced. It still raises many questions. Why did it happen? Who participated? What impact did it have on our city's development? This program will present recollections of the riot by eyewitnesses, both blacks and whites. But most important, we ask you whether Atlantans of the 1980s can benefit from a look backwards at such an unpleasant part of our past. Some survivors of the riot refuse to discuss what they saw, even 74 years later. They prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. But historians believe that progress requires an understanding of what we leave behind, where we are coming from. Many eyewitnesses agreed. WRFG invites you to travel back with us to September 1906 and decide for yourself. Kathleen Adams and Annie Alexander were young women at that time. In 1906, Atlanta was a little disturbed over working conditions. The races uh, had not integrated as uh, we find them today. It was a definite separation, especially in the working field and in the social in those days, you could just go out and lynch a man for anything. Segregation had ruled the South since the 1890s, but Jim Crow laws did not bring racial peace. The Atlanta riot was one of more than 40 race riots in the decade from 1898 to 1908, and part of a pattern of violence that included several hundred lynchings a year. Blacks slowly gained ground in the skilled trades, in education, and in business especially in rapidly growing cities like Atlanta. But Southern whites sought to strip the blacks of what little political power they had gained and to stifle any black hopes for social and economic equality. Voting rights were a major battleground. Just before the Atlanta riot, Hoke Smith, owner of the Atlanta Journal, ran for governor of Georgia against Constitution editor Clark Howell. Howell felt that the white primary was enough to discourage blacks from voting. Smith wanted to go further. With reference to Negro suffrage, I advocate the retention of those things which we now have to preserve white supremacy, namely the poll tax and white primaries. I also advocate the adoption of all additional legislation which can be constitutionally based to make white supremacy easy and permanent. In 37 counties in Georgia, more Negroes than white men have paid their poll tax. In all local elections, as matters now stand, the ignorant and purchasable Negro has a vote equal to that of the white man. Without further argument, it is clear that great benefits will come to the people of Georgia by the adoption of a constitutional amendment formed after the lines of those amendments adopted in our sister southern states, which will disfranchise 90% of the Negroes of the state through an educational requirement for voting, and the right to vote will be preserved to the white men of Georgia. Max Barber, editor of the Atlanta magazine The Voice of the Negro, wrote, It was not a short, snappy campaign like you have in the North. We had 18 long months of his vituperation. 
this governor that was trying to get in office uh, got the people all stirred up that it was the Negroes that was doing all this devilment. On September 5, 1906, Hoke Smith won the white primary nomination and in effect the election for governor of Georgia. The four Atlanta daily newspapers, all white, continued to trumpet the cause of white supremacy after election fever died down. They focused on two symbols of white anxiety, insults to white women and idle blacks. They blamed the saloons for an increase in crime, especially by black men against white women. Lurid stories filled the headlines, as Evelyn Witherspoon, Ethel Myers, and Clarence Feebleman recall. Word got around that, that some white women had been raped, and, of course, that stirred up great trouble. There had been several white women raped. The men, a white man, had become afraid to leave home in the morning to go to work, uh, and told their wives to stay in, and of course that gets intolerable, especially in the days when there was no such thing as air conditioning. And finally, they just armed themselves. We had a neighbor, he was a lawyer, and he insisted on Dad having a pistol, a gun. We never had a gun in our home, but he insisted that we should be armed and he got a pistol for my husband. It started just like so many of those events started uh, by the accusations against blacks that white women were being molested, white women were being accosted, white women were being raped, and that they were insulting the white children. It all was a tension brought about mostly fictitiously about the activities of blacks against the whites. One rape suspect was lynched in July. Three near lynchings took place in the suburbs during August and September. The Atlanta Evening News was especially inflammatory. The news would like to see an analysis of the so-called blood which runs through the veins of a man who is not in favor of lynching these black devils at sight. The news, with a daily circulation of 25,000, was Fulton County's official newspaper of record. In August, the news began a reward fund for the capture of suspected black rapists. $1,000 was raised in one day. Encouraged, the news next announced that it would purchase a pack of bloodhounds for hunting down suspects. It also endorsed a proposal to reactivate the Ku Klux Klan. Headlines screamed all through August and September. Work for bloodhounds and shotguns. Another awful crime in its lesson. Negro messenger from Hades. Punishment must be swift. Ku Klux Klan to protect women is now proposed. By all means, organize the KKK. Men of Georgia, bestir yourselves. Stop the crimes and lynching will cease, and not before. A popular play, The Klansman had drawn crowds in Atlanta the previous winter. It was later made into D.W. Griffith's pro-Klan film, Birth of a Nation. In September, the Constitution's reviewer praised the Klansman as something more than a play for Southern people. It is an institution to which they will remain loyal as long as the Southland endures. Papers, I don't know whether they were responsible for it, but they certainly uh, had many articles about the this black man assaulting a white woman, whether it was true or not, it, it fed the flames, it fed the fire. Ray Stannard Baker, a northern journalist, visited Atlanta in 1906 to study race relations. He reported, I had a personal investigation made of every crime against a white woman committed by Negroes in the few months before and after the riot. 
Of 12 such crimes, three were cases of rape horrible in their details. Three were aggravated attempts at rape. Three may have been attempts. Three were pure cases of fright on the part of the woman. And in one, the white woman, first asserting that the Negro had assaulted her, finally confessed attempted suicide. Assault could mean almost anything. That September, a mob chased one black man who had frightened a white woman by being, quote, where he had no business to be, unquote, even though he ran as soon as he saw her. Five days before the riot, Atlanta City Council and Police Board vowed to close half the saloons on downtown Decatur Street where many blacks congregated. Special liquor licenses were required and refused. The police force was doubled. On the morning of September 22nd, police began to round up unemployed blacks. A black saloon keeper was arrested for displaying pictures of white nudes, as Vaseline Usher recalls. It started about some pictures that were of white women that were on the walls down at, uh, on Decatur Street. That's what it said it started about, those pictures on those walls. And they were pictures that those men just, just, just for something to put on the wall. They, they, they didn't mean anything to them at all. Saturday's evening news carried this editorial. Vicious blacks are sounding the doom of their race. The wonder is that the white men did not begin in earnest a real warfare on the blacks. We prefer peace and order, but if it must be war, the white men are ready to face it. In the name of heaven, what else can white men do except make war to the bitter end against the black devils who continue to attack defenseless white women? There is no use to deceive ourselves about the situation. A conflict terrible in its consequences is surely coming. The men of this community will stand it no longer. They will begin a warfare on the black race that will mean hell itself to every one of them. The blacks will be destroyed, annihilated, and completely vanquished if they do not stop these crimes. Those things don't just happen overnight. They build up, and then they explode. Hello? Hi, I'm calling about the two-bedroom apartment you advertise. Is it still available? Sure. Great. Unless you're black or Latino or disabled. Or Housing discrimination is rarely this obvious, but it's just as real and just as illegal. So if you hear things like, I can't assign you a handicapped parking space. That could be housing discrimination. And the only way to stop it is to report it so we can investigate. If you think you have been a victim of housing discrimination, Metro Fair Housing Services may be able to help. The number is 404-524-0000. Fair housing is your right. This has been another public service announcement brought to you by your listener-sponsored and supported Community Radio, 89.3 FM, WRFG.org. September 22nd, a hot, sultry day. Crowds of men gathered on downtown street corners. The first edition of the evening news headlined a new assault. An extra edition appeared, announcing a second assault. Then a third, and a fourth. The downtown crowds grew and tempers rose. About 10 o'clock Saturday night, a man mounted a box on Marietta Street near the post office and holding aloft a newspaper extra shouted, more assaults by Negroes on white women. Are we Southern white men gonna stand for this? No, came a yell from those who heard him. Kill the niggers and our women will be safe, yelled someone. Kill the niggers was taken up by the others and soon the crowd was running along the crowded streets. The New York Times. And, and so th they went out to kill these Negroes and lynch them in, in this riot. Prominent speakers plead with the mob. Fire department called to disperse rioters with water. The mob, yelling for blood, rushed upon a Negro barber shop just across from the federal building. Get them, get them all. With this for their slogan, the crowd, armed with heavy clubs, canes, revolvers, several rifles, stones and weapons of every description, made a rush upon the Negro barber shop. Those in the first line of the crowd made known their coming by throwing bricks and stones that went crashing through the windows and glass doors. Hard upon these missiles rushed such a sea of angry men and boys as swept everything before them. The two Negro barbers working at their chairs made no effort to meet the mob. One man held up both hands. A brick caught him in the face and at the same time shots were fired. Both men fell to the floor. Still unsatisfied, the mob rushed into the barber shop, leaving the place a mass of ruins. The bodies of both barbers were first kicked and then dragged from the place. Many of the crowd tore at their clothing, taking rags home for souvenirs or waving them above their heads to invite further riot. When dragged into the streets, the faces of both barbers were terribly mutilated, while the floor of the shop was wet with puddles of blood. 
On and on their bodies were dragged to where the new building of the electric and gas company stands. In the alleyway by the side of the building, the bodies were thrown together. Another portion of the mob busied itself with the Negro they found on the streets. Felled with a single blow, shots were fired at the body until the crowd, for its own safety, called for a halt, yelling, Beat them up, beat them up, you'll kill good white men by shooting. The mob began beating the bodies of the Negro, which was already far beyond any possibility of struggle or pain. Satisfied that the Negro was dead, his body was thrown by the side of the two Negro barbers and left there, the pile of three making a ghastly monument to the work of the night, and almost within the shadow of the monument of Henry W. Grady, Atlanta Constitution. They say they threw two or three of colored men off of the Versailles Street viaduct. My father was a businessman in Atlanta. He told me about working late one night and coming out of his office late and discovered that there were mobs rioting on the streets and they were rioting on the streets on Marietta Street right near where the Henry Grady Monument now stands and my father said he saw members of this mob take black persons off the streetcar and carry them to the Forsyth Street viaduct and throw them literally over the sides of the viaduct onto the railroad tracks below so it was a fierce and terrible night. There was a streetcar coming along Auburn Avenue and they opened fire on it. It was loaded with colored people. And the colored people got down in the aisle, crouched down, but they went on murdering anyway, just indiscriminately. Anybody that was colored was condemned. As John Griffin and Evelyn Witherspoon noted, streetcars were a major target of the attack. Attack by mobs on streetcars. Car number 207 stopped and when the mob saw that it contained several Negroes, it was quickly boarded. Men climbed into it through the windows, while others forced their way through the doors. The white men and women hastened out, and they were allowed to pass, but the Negroes were hemmed in, and the fighting began. One Negro woman fought like a savage wildcat with an umbrella. Another tried to use a hat pin. They were fighting for their lives, and they knew it. The three or four Negro men only ducked their heads. One begged piteously for mercy, and his only answer was a blow with a stick. The police boarded the car and tried to get the white men out. The officers used no violence. After the Negro men were lying on the floor of the car, the officers succeeded in forcing the white men out of the doors. The car slowly made its way to Broad Street. In the bottom of it were four Negro men and three Negro women. The police stated that three of the men had been beaten to death. A car came in from West Fair and on it were two Negroes. The mob had boarded it before the police knew it had arrived. A dozen or more white men beat the Negroes over the head with clubs and brass knuckles until the Negroes fell on the floor unconscious and in pools of blood. Again the police went to the assistance of the Negroes. It was said that both these Negroes were dead. A Negro on a trolley car got off to run, drew a pistol and fired two shots. He was chased and ran into a store. The mob followed. They tore down the doors and caught the Negro who was put on the death list. Another car came past. Two cowering Negroes were dragged through the windows. The usual scene of beating him with sticks and fists was indulged in for a few moments while the Negro cried for mercy. Your race didn't have any mercy on white women. Over the bridge with him, boys. The next moment the Negro was lifted by shoulders and feet and flung heavily over the bridge, a sheer fall of ten feet. But he lit on his feet and started running. The crowd started in pursuit. Two or three pistols flashed from the pockets and a volley of six or eight shots were fired. It is thought that he was wounded as he was seen to stagger. Another Negro jumped off a streetcar and ran under the Forsyth Bridge. He was shot and killed instantly. Atlanta Constitution. And they killed a lot of Negroes. One Negro man jumped ran up a post, way up on top of a telegraph post, even being killed. Reverend Rush was so light, he looked like a white man, let him pass, because they thought, they didn't ask me the question, they thought he was white, so let him pass. And... Uh, Several other real fair men passed, but they came through and told how bad it was up on Whitehall Street, how they were killing Negroes up there. Seven-year-old Evelyn Witherspoon witnessed a killing. I woke up somewhere around midnight and could feel tension in the room. My mother and her sister were kneeling in front of the window, looking out into the street. And I got up and said, what is it? They said, go back to bed. 
But I knew something was going on, and I came to the window and uh, knelt down between them, and there I saw a man strung up to the light pole, uh, men and boys on the street below were shooting at him till they riddled his body with bullets. He was kicking, flailing his legs when I looked out. He was alive. I suppose the way they had strung him up was really choking him to death. I think they put a noose around his neck. But the bullets stopped the uh, movement of the arms and legs. Well, that was a horrifying scene. Southern trees bear a strange fruit Blood on the leaves And blood at the root Black body swinging in the southern breeze Strange fruit hanging From the poplar trees oh. We had a very good colored girl living in the home with us. Help with the baby and help with the cooking and just a general helper. And I remember hearing her crying in, in her room, they're killing my people, they're killing my people. So of course, I went in with her, and Dad and I tried to soothe her and told her no, they weren't killing her people. And that she was safe and satisfied that trouble was over, they didn't amount to anything, and tried to ease her in that way. She, she thought the people were being killed. Just like, like I would have been if I thought the Jews were being killed. And they killed Negroes, slaughtered them like sheep. They were caught downtown after sitting out on, on that night. Here is a strange and bitter crop. Oh. descended on the railway station, beating and killing black porters and waiters, and waylaying unsuspecting black passengers as they arrived at the station. On Peter Street near the Terminal Railroad Station, a hard fight took place. This was started by a Negro shooting at the crowd below from a second-story window. A brick hit him, and he fell back and died in a few minutes. The New York Times. While the newspapers reported the mob's actions in the center of town, similar events were occurring elsewhere. Clarence Feebleman lived a little further south, where the Atlanta Stadium now stands. In that area, between, uh, I would say, Pryor Street and Grants Park, there were quite a number of Negroes living there. And that's how we happened to become, to know about the, the incidents up to and including the riot. We could hear the shots and hear the yells and chasing up and down George Avenue where the, the whites were chasing the Negro and yells and hollering and that sort of stuff killed the Negro. There was electricity in there. Even as a boy of 10, I can remember that my parents were frightened. Everybody was. After all, when you hear gunfire in what's supposed to be a peaceful residential neighborhood, you don't... Uh, you don't feel secure in the same people as I just said before. The people that would be bigoted against the blacks would be bigoted against the Jews, too. It's one and the same thing. It was close enough for, for it to be a menace. It could have turned at any time, you know. And uh, for the first time that I can remember, 
we had firearms in the house. My father bought a shotgun. We didn't know what was going to happen. It was a very tense, very tense situation. A few blocks away, one witness's father ran a shoe shop. Papa didn't come home that night. There was sound out no shop again. He didn't come home that night. My oldest brother, Robert, didn't either. And Mama said, Ruth, go up to, go up to uh, shop and see where your dad is, see what, what happened to your father. We didn't know it had been a riot, a race riot. So I was a little girl, and I never should get Mama had my, always put my hand two long plaits. And so on every corner was two policemen stationed. So I got to the first corner up on Richmond and Martin. They said, little girl, where you going? Where you live? I said, down here, down there at the bottom of the street. Where you going? I said, go and see where Papa and my brother didn't come home last night. So where, did, where, where are they? I said, he operates a shoe shop. And I said, he didn't come home. Mama's worried about him. And so, all right, go ahead. Be careful. And next, got to the next corner. Two more policemen questioned me. So when I got to the shop, I knocked on the door. And Papa, he said, who is it? I said, it's me. He said, who is me? I said, Rue, you only doing just me like that. He scared me. I said, what happened? He said, did anybody bother you? I said, uh-uh. I said, two policemen stand on every corner, though, asked me a whole lot of questions. So he said, all right, come on in. And then he told me what happened. So he and Robert were scared to come home at night because they were killing Negroes. And uh, so he said, I wouldn't go home because he said, you stay here. We're going home after a while, but we're going to stay here until we go. There's no way in the world because we didn't have a telephone. We couldn't touch the mama and tell her what was happening. So around about noon that day, we went on back down down Richmond Street home, and he told what happened. But I never shall forget they questioned me, they pushed me, and looked at me so funny like they said, "Wonder how that woman let this child this time?" And I, I guess we hadn't heard anything about it. We hadn't. So Papa and my brother come that night; they would have been killed. Then they called out the militia. They called at that time it was the militia, not the National Guard. Irwin Shields was a 14-year-old newsboy. I was carrying a Constitution paper out. My father went, went with me to deliver these papers and all. There's some malicious patrolling the streets and all, helping the police, you know. I wouldn't have been able to get it out if I hadn't been carrying that Constitution paper out. As Shields carried his papers, Mrs. Usher's brother continued his job. I had a brother who was working as, as a Western Union boy, and he didn't have any trouble at all. Came home and had no, no trouble, and another boy was killed. Rain came and sent everybody home, and that was a great blessing. They were just patrolling there trying to protect property and people, whites and blacks alike. After all, both of them needed protection, you know. People don't, uh, people don't get... Uh, shot at without some <laughs> uh, reverse uh, action. Uh, they, they take it a certain long length of time, and they can't take it any longer, and they, they act up, which is understandable. This is Heather Gray, the producer of Just Peace on WRG Atlanta 89.3 FM. Tonight, you're listening to the recording that was done of the research that was done by Harlan Joy, the founder of WRG, and Cliff Kuhn and others involved in this project to look at the 1906 race riot in Atlanta. There's been another lynching and another grain of sand. Wells the mountain of reason men oh there's a good in the land Negroes attack Inman Park car, seventeen bag by squad of Company B. Black shot through windows of an Inman Park car returning to city filled with passengers, but no one was hurt. The Atlanta Constitution. On Sunday, the riot continued. Horace Sinclair was six. He remembers stories of blacks defending themselves. The riot was on a Saturday night. And that Sunday night, the white folks were going down there where the bad niggas were. And they got for us Houston Street. And they, they had torches and they waiting for them. They went back up Houston Street, back on in town, went on about their business. They didn't go down to Dogtown. Walter White, later head of the NAACP, was 13. 
His father was a postman. He described in his autobiography how his family faced a mob that night. Late in the afternoon, friends of my father's came to warn of more trouble that night. They told us that plans had been perfected for a mob to form on Peachtree Street just after nightfall to march down Houston Street to what the white people called Dark Town, three blocks or so below our house, to clean out the niggers. There had never been a firearm in our house before that day. We turned out the lights early, as did our neighbors. No one removed his clothes or thought of sleep. Apprehension was tangible. Toward midnight, the unnatural quiet was broken by a roar that grew steadily in volume. Even today, I grow tense remembering it. Father told mother to take my sisters to the rear of the house. He and I, the only males in the house, took our place at the front windows of the parlor. In a very few minutes, the vanguard of the mob appeared. Some were bearing torches, a voice which we recognized as that of the son of the grocer with whom we had traded for many years yelled, that's where that nigger mail carrier lives. Let's burn it down. It's too nice for a nigger to live in. In the eerie light, father turned his drawn face toward me. In a voice, as quiet as though he were asking me to pass him the sugar at the breakfast table, he said, son, don't shoot until the first man puts his foot on the lawn, and then don't you miss. In the flickering light, the mob swayed, paused, and began to flow toward us. I put my gun aside and tried to relax. The mob moved toward the lawn. I tried to aim my gun, wondering what it would feel like to kill a man. Suddenly, there was a volley of shots. The mob hesitated, stopped. Some friends of my father's had barricaded themselves in a two-story brick building just below our house. It was they who had fired. Some of the mobsmen, still bloodthirsty, shouted, Let's go get the nigger. Others, afraid now for their safety, held back. Our friends, knowing the hesitation, fired another volley. The mob broke and retreated up Houston Street. From the beginning of the country, we have always had firearms in our homes for protection. You hardly find a family that didn't have uh, its own personal uh, protection, firearms. That was a custom. William H. Krogman, later president of Clark College, credited the Darktown resistance with cooling the riot. You are listening to the Atlanta Race Riot of 1906. This is WRFG in Atlanta, Georgia. On Saturday night, whites had made a rush to buy guns. Later that night, a mob broke into a Peter Street hardware store, stripping it of weapons. On Sunday, the sheriff and the militia banned sales of arms and ammunition to all except known law-abiding white citizens. On Sunday, they wrote 10,000 permits for guns. In the meantime, the militia and police were confiscating guns owned by blacks. Here is Professor E.T. Lewis, who was six at the time. Negroes were put to a disadvantage due to the fact that they, although they were able to, to get guns, uh, and most of them already had guns, but uh, ammunition, they had to buy ammunition, and they had to get that from the whites. Uh, the pawn shops uh, sold most of the ammunition at that particular time. If you wanted uh, some bullets for your gun, you went to a pawn shop to get them. And of course, uh, knowing that, uh, that this trouble was going on, the pawn shops had been instructed not to sell an ammunition to any Negro, but to sell it to the whites. So whites could come and get all the ammunition that they needed, and uh, when Negro uh, tried to buy, they wouldn't sell it to them. But the Negroes soon found a solution to that, because there were uh, a few Negroes that look like whites. They were white-skinned and blue-eyed and, and had uh, uh, straight black hair. So they, they would come and buy the ammunition as white men. Uh, they would come and buy the ammunition go out there and kill these damn niggers. And uh, so... Uh, uh, most of the time, the, the uh, pawn broker would give them the ammunition because they thought that they were 
uh, helping a, a, a good call. White Atlantans invaded other black neighborhoods. In Oakland City, just southwest of Atlanta, a rape had been reported on Friday. A suspect was arrested and released. Mary Morton, then eight, lived just north of Oakland City. I just heard some of the news of some folks over in Oakland or some other saying something was going on on the hill. You know, up around here, the men all stayed around in the backyard to see if there was anybody coming to do anything to them. I didn't know whether they were going to start shooting or what. My mother and father, the crowd of them went away from here, went up near West End. Roy Harwell's family lived in West End. In one of that area back over south of the railroad over there, there's a very fine family of colored people over there that worked the same place my father did. And they were too frightened to even stay at home. And they stayed in this house for 10 days, and the whole family slept in this house. We slept all over the floor and pallets and everything else for 10 days in this very house with that nigger family. It's pretty bad from Saturday night until about Wednesday. I was afraid I'd hear what they were doing. And I was afraid they would get over there, but uh, they, they didn't come in our part. But they did a lot of mischief. I had a, a cousin that lived in South Atlanta, and she had a, a son, and they, they mobbed him, and uh, he died. I, I think that was the cause of his death. Uh, they, they beat him up so that night. Dr. Penn, one of our finest physicians here, a graduate of Harvard, he had just bought a new car, and the first Negro had a car. They bring that car to charcoal and beat him up. He lived out here, right near Clark on Ridge Avenue. Lived right pretty home out there. Kathleen Adams recalls some of the antagonisms between Brownsville, or South Atlanta, the home of two black colleges, and the adjoining white community. On the south side of Atlanta, in a community known as South Atlanta, there was quite a bit of social disturbance. There's a large park out there known as uh, Lakewood Park. The Negro population was kept from using the facilities of the park. At night, the boys of the community slipped over the fence and Negro Atlanta enjoyed the lake out there. It was discovered and quite a bit of disturbance um, came to life over that. Gammon Theological Seminary and Clark College opened their doors to frightened refugees. South Atlanta braced for an attack. On Monday morning, Fulton County police heard of a meeting to discuss the riot. Accompanied by other armed whites, they entered the community. Ruby Owens was a young wife and mother. She remembers the community preparing for an attack. No white folk down Lakewood, they're going to come up here. We're all going to protect ourselves. Because the folks up there, they're going to shoot down there, give signal that they've come in on us. So when we got word that they're coming in this way, some of these folks up there, they come down this way. To protect us, this woman asked her, come over here, woman, come over here. I was going to her house, give me a big old butcher knife. I was standing out there in the yard with a butcher knife. All the men on that side of the street, women on this side, you know, we were going to fight our way through, but we seen all them white folks come, them folks, colored folks from this, they run in the house. They done run back in the house, left me in the yard, and the white folks just coming on down the street. Oh, white boys had old sticks and room houses and everything. Getting a colored men. She run back in the house. And I said, they said, come on, on. I saw tremble, I couldn't move. Come on, come on, on, come on. I couldn't drop the knife and I couldn't move. She had to come out and get me, put me in the house. It scared me so bad. <laughs> in the ensuing confrontation, a county policeman was killed and others wounded. Four black men died. The area was surrounded and a house-to-house -house search began. Mrs. Owens recalls the arrests and helping her husband flee to safety. She also hid his pistol. They rushed all these folks around here. All they rushed, a whole lot of all these colored folks around here. I heard he come back home. He come back home, I had old love. I had old Mother Hubbard. 
I put that Mother Hubbard on him to play like he's a woman. And we walked from here to Capitol Avenue, me and my dear child and him walked from here up there, going back out to Mama from House to Street. They searched in the house, taking your guns and things away from him. He had a nice little pistol. And I hid his pistol and things. And I came out to Mama's, stayed out there for a day or two, and Mama took and kept me to Monroe, Georgia, whole home. She came down there for a day or two, left my hood one here. He wouldn't go. 300 men were arrested and marched to jail covered by a machine gun, including the president of Gammon Theological Seminary, who was also beaten. Mrs. Owen's husband was nearly arrested. His brother was less lucky. Mrs. Owens visited him in jail. But they had already locked his brother up. My, his brother was called for somebody to come see by him, and I went to jail. And I couldn't talk to him for the other folks telling me to get, get him out. Mrs. Owens, Mrs. Owens, tell somebody to come get me. Tell somebody to come get me. <laughs> they let him out. I don't think they arrested nobody about it. They just locked him up for a while. Because, you know, they killed a whole lot of folks out here in South Atlanta. Yes, it's a triple I just sat it down to kill. Hello? Hi, I'm calling about the two-bedroom apartment you advertise. Is it still available? Sure. Great. Unless you're black or Latino or disabled. Or Housing discrimination is rarely this obvious, but it's just as real and just as illegal. So if you hear things like, I can't assign you a handicapped parking space. That could be housing discrimination. And the only way to stop it is to report it so we can investigate it. If you think you have been a victim of housing discrimination, Metro Fair Housing Services may be able to help. The number is 404-524-0000. Fair housing is your right. This has been another public service announcement brought to you by your listener sponsored and supported Community Radio 89.3 FM WRFG.org. The undertaker, David T. Howard, who was the leading Negro undertaker in the city, was called to South Atlanta to pick up a body, and he went out. But when he got ready to dress the body, he called the H.M. Pattersons and told them to come over to his place and pick up the body that he had brought in from South Atlanta. And it turned out that this was a Caucasian that had his face black. So they never knew who was doing the shooting, whether it was all on the white side or how much of it was on the Negro side. Mr. Howard told his granddaughter the same story. The motives and actions of the black-faced white man are unclear, but we do know how blacks in South Atlanta died. A correspondent for the Boston Advertiser wrote, I was out to the Negro settlement Monday and witnessed a piece of savagery never to be forgotten. The mob found an old man, probably 60 years old, in bed, having been beaten up by the mob early. When they entered his cabin, he began to implore them by the name of boss, young master, etc., not to further harm him. In the presence of sworn deputies and soldiers, this old Negro man was literally shot and beat to death. I saw him, and he was an unrecognizable mass in his bed. The woods were literally full of dead Negroes who had sought safety after being shot by the soldiers mostly. Order was restored when the whites were surfeited on butchery. I heard soldiers and policemen regret their badges of office in order that they might join in the slaughter. I do not believe any policeman took a hand in the actual killing of Negroes, but the soldiers did. A woman grieves in silence Close beside an open door Flung flimsy on her doorstep Lies a corpse upon the floor You'll not ask me why I'm silent The woman said to me Her eyes blaze with anger And her heart cried agony Elizabeth McDuffie was later to become famous as President Roosevelt's housekeeper. At the time of the riot, she was working as a maid for a white family on the edge of South Atlanta. She wrote this description for Ebony Magazine. 
Tuesday morning, I watched the march from South Atlanta. Negro families streamed by the Hillier House on Capitol Avenue, loaded down with their pitiful bundles of household treasures and clothing. They were fleeing from the riot section of the city to the homes of relatives and friends in other parts of Atlanta, innocent men, women, and children, haunted and fearful for their lives. Perhaps because I remember that fearful march of my people from South Atlanta, my job at the White House became a little more than a job. It became a crusade. By September 26th, the Atlanta Journal was already reassuring its readers. Atlanta is herself again. When Atlanta awoke Wednesday morning, every sigh and echo of recent disturbances were gone. Whistles were blowing from all the suspended factories, wagons and carts rumbling down the streets. Laborers swinging their dinner buckets were bustling back to work. Shopkeepers opening their doors, children sprinting off to school, and everybody's face wore the fresh rested look that betokens a night of sound sleep. The trouble, the danger, and the fear are matters of memory. But many blacks were not so easily convinced that all was over. Here is Mrs. Witherspoon again. But for a week afterward, the colored people were afraid to appear on the streets. We had a Negro cabin back of our house, the way they had been built in the days of slavery. And there was a nice couple there, Ed and Henrietta, had lived there many years, quiet people. Henrietta took in washing, and Ed went to work somewhere, I don't know where. Well, when the riot began, they shut their door and their one window and didn't come out. And after a good many days' time, my mother went around to the window and asked Ed if they had plenty of food. And he said, no, they were about out. My mother said, you can go to the store. That was only a block away. And if anybody bothers you, come to my basement and you'll be safe. So a few minutes later, he came up the steep front steps. We had 22 front steps. He came flying up around the house and into the basement. And my mother came out and faced three teenagers with guns in their hands. And she said, what do you want? And they said, we saw a nigger run around here. And she said, you're on private property. Turn around and go back. And they did. They would have murdered him in cold blood. And he was a good man. He was three years old when freedom came. Many blacks fled the city, including the relatives of L.D. Keith. We were in Alabama at the time, and my uncle sent his wife and daughter to Alabama to uh, get out of this tense situation for perhaps two or three weeks or maybe a month. Mayor Woodward declared, The riot is a closed incident. Everyone ought to forget it and seek to return to normal conditions. The good citizen will not create any disorder. The lawless element must not. It was the calm. It's, it's just like, I think, after a storm. There's a calmness of the uh, stillness of Appomattox. Everything seemed to be fine. There was no reference to it to any great extent after the riot. And people seemed to um, be more tolerant of the blacks. I think that's what happened. I think, that, I think they got a great deal of sympathy from it. 1,000 prominent white Atlantans and some black leaders met on September 26th to plan the restoration of public order. Ray Stannard Baker reported that attorney Charles Hopkins of the Atlanta Civic League spoke for many of the whites present. Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, the credit of Atlanta was good for any number of millions of dollars in New York or Boston or any financial center. Today, we couldn't borrow 50 cents. The reputation we have been building up so arduously for years has been swept away in two short hours. 
not by men who have made and make Atlanta, not by men who represent the character and strength of our city, but by hoodlums, white criminals. Innocent Negro men have been struck down for no crime whatever, while peacefully enjoying the life and liberty guaranteed to every American citizen. The Negro race is a child race. We are a strong race. They're guardians. We have boasted of our superiority, and we have now sunk to this level. We have shed the blood of our helpless wards. I, for one, and I believe I voice the best sentiment of this city, am willing to lay down my life rather than to have the scenes of the last few days repeated. I think Atlanta began to get better after that riot and after they had had all this uh, to do. I, I think that was one thing that showed Atlanta up. A committee of safety was formed to prevent future outbreaks. Another committee collected a relief fund to compensate the riot victims. It reported, Among the victims of the mob, there was not a single vagrant. They were earning wages and useful work up to the time of the riot. By all accounts, a number of rioters took part in each assault. It is clear that several hundred murderers, or would-be murderers, are at large in this community. The crimes of the mob included robbery as well as murder. In the commission of these crimes, the victims were treated with unspeakable brutality. It is amazing that the things we have recited could have happened in Atlanta. A Fulton County grand jury investigation concluded. The editorial utterances of the Atlanta newspapers were calculated to create a disregard for the proper administration of the law and to promote the organization of the citizens to act outside of the law in the punishment of crimes. The riot was a godsend because it made both races evaluate themselves and a coalition of the races. Editor Max Barber disagreed. Behold, we have peace. No, not peace but a wilderness called peace. Sixty or seventy colored people are in jail for killing one policeman, while sixteen whites are in jail for the whole riot, which resulted in the murdering and maiming of more than a hundred people. Half of the city's best black population are preparing to leave daily. Some of them left their homes and never did come back. So it was a terrible time. One riot refugee was Max Barber himself. He had written anonymously to a New York City newspaper stating, The cause of this riot? Sensational newspapers and unscrupulous politicians. The next day after the latter's publication, I was sent for by Captain James English, president of the Fourth National Bank of Atlanta, a member of the Board of Police Commissioners, and Governor Terrell's chief of staff. I was told that that letter was a vile slander on Atlanta and that the man who wrote it would serve a sentence on the Georgia chain gang or leave the town. Mr. English's last command was that I straighten myself out with the Atlanta white people at once. Well, I saw that my letter had been traced through the telegraph operator. I did not care to be made a slave on a Georgia chain gang, and the only other alternative I had was to get out of Atlanta. Barber fled to Chicago, where he continued the magazine renamed The Voice without missing an issue. But Atlanta's white journalists and politicians concentrated their criticisms on black saloon goers, whom they considered the ultimate cause of white violence. The news resumed its attack on those it called the perpetrators of the awful deeds committed against the white women of this community. Despite the grand jury's accusation that the news had helped cause the riot, 
Its editor was not asked to leave town as Max Barber had been. One year after the riot, Georgia enacted prohibition and the saloons closed. But the relief committee had found that none of the riot victims were vagrants, nor were the white rioters hoodlums as many wished to believe. Well-dressed men were observed in the mob. Most of those arrested were clerks and skilled workers. There is no peace in Atlanta. The Negroes may be humbler and more polite, but they do not so impress me in their letters. They say that if they wrote what they felt, the paper upon which they wrote would shrivel into ashes. There is extensive and deep-seated dissatisfaction. There will be discontent as long as present conditions prevail. The riot was never forgotten by those who lived through it, and it altered many lives. But its lessons were not transmitted to future generations. I never heard anything about this, either from my family or, or in school. In neither high school or grammar school did we learn anything about these uh, riots, disturbances that went on. Facts became dimmer after many years. Even some who remember the riot now minimize its impact. Uh, I don't know of any shooting that went on in the downtown section, uh, but they would, you know, try to beat you, kick you, that kind of thing if you went in the downtown section. I guess I was thinking even for my generation, they always bring out the National Guard or something. No, they didn't have the National Guard. Out. Now, I never heard of anybody... Never heard of the police force, nor anyone being called out to stop any disturbance. I don't remember hearing of anybody being killed. It may have been more of a scare than anything else. It may have been a little thing that was um, built up to be a big thing. It didn't amount to as much as it appears to from this distance. Uh, but the important thing then was that nothing of that nature had ever happened in Atlanta before. We never had a problem like that. So no matter how small it was, it was going to be a big problem. Most people think of a riot as something being bloody, and uh, a lot of casualties, but Atlanta's riot wasn't like that. Now, Atlanta has always, if you go back through the history of it, been a city where the races got along fairly well together. They made definite lines of division, of course. It was terrible times in Atlanta. I don't think that Atlanta really come to itself until Martin Luther came. This program was produced for WRFG in Atlanta, Georgia by Harlan and Barbara Joy. Interviews were conducted by Bernard West and Cliff Kuhn. Technical production by Cindy Garber and Melanie Collins. Historical consultants were Charles Crow, Marcellus Barksdale, and Mark Bauman. Narration was read by Norman Turner. Dramatizations by Burl Boykin, Larry Johnson, Ebon Dooley, Paul Williams, J.C. Sullivan and L.C. Sullivan. This program is financially assisted by the Committee for the Humanities in Georgia. Views expressed herein do not necessarily reflect those of the Committee for the Humanities in Georgia or the National Endowment for the Humanities. <laughs>